Well, you're in the Premier League with Stoke City. This will be the final season of your Yo Man. Our final opportunity to try and top the leaderboard. Let's go see how our summer transfer business has went. So we started with a transfer budget of a £50 million pound plus, which we did then adjust to increase our wage budget. But of that remaining, we only have £4 million pounds and maybe £100,000 available in the wages. So where has that money gone? Let's start with the out. We sold £82 million pounds worth of players while spending £152 million quid. Our highest sale was Luke Sanders, who went to join relegated Burnley for £18.25 million. Pounds. He was a fantastic centre-half for us in the Championship English as well. But again, at 29 years old, doesn't quite have the attributes, capabilities for the Premier League, at least in my opinion. So I was happy to get as much money for him as we did. And just speaking of Burnley, by the way, I know it's completely unrelated, but I wanted to show you a player they have signed in the Championship. They sold £156 million worth of players after being relegated, including Marvin Monganga, our former guy at Crystal Palace. They then spent £101 million on Armando Sanchez from Real Madrid. Armando Sanchez has joined a Championship club. Look at that. That is ridiculous. I have never, ever seen anything like that on Football Manager 20, especially from the AI. But anyway, getting a little bit sidetracked, we then saw Deval to Galatasaray for £16.5 million. Pounds. Now, if you remember Deval, I was actually anticipating playing him in the Premier League, but we have been able to sign much better players. So we needed to free up some funds from somewhere, and he was one of our most valuable players to be able to do that. So Galatasaray, £16.5 million, quid, I think is a good bit of business for him. He's pretty well-rounded as it is, but we have better options now. The next to leave was League Cup final hero Elson Slager for £12.5 million to Al Hilal in Saudi Arabia. At 31 years old, even though he is pretty versatile, he was never going to make our first 11. And it's unlikely he would even make our bench at this point. So, decided to cash in and I'm very happy to do so. The next to leave the club was Paul Watson, who went to join Fulham for £12.25 million. Again, another very versatile English option, but at 28 years old, was never making our first team. Julian de San Pedro was next to leave. He joined AEK for £11.5 million initially, which could rise to £14.25 million. Quid. A technically fantastic Spanish centre midfielder, but again, he's a little bit too specialised and not well-rounded enough to be able to justify a place in our squad in the Premier League. We also sold Serginho Guerrero to Norwich for £7 million. Quid. He did actually play quite a lot of football for us last season as a right wing-back, but we've got better options there now. Uh, particularly with Delonzo and Stelvagen, we had two better options, so we had to move him on for a decent amount of fee. Oleg Sherbach, you're not to say much of him. He was on loan at another club for the majority of the rest of last season. Uh, he's went and joined Tenerife for £3.9 million, a capable centre-half, just not quite at the Premier League level. And Comer Cormac Sheridan, I have no idea who he is. He left on a free. So that takes us swiftly on to the in. Steve Hudson was the first to join us on a free transfer. He's going to be a backup goalkeeper. We didn't actually need one, but we needed someone who was English to be able to fill out our squad registration properly. So not, nothing much to see here. And he's an interesting one. I can't show you him because he's retired. Bruno Sabelli, we had signed from Boca Juniors for 49 k Now we think behind Bruno Sabelli was... He was a set-piece specialist, technically and mentally unbelievable. Just physically, he was terrible as a 35-year-old. He was going to be an impact sub coming off the bench for us when we were struggling in games. But he'd only been with the club for about seven days before he then decided he was going to retire. So instead of just rejecting our contract offer and staying at Bottle Juniors to retire there, he came to us for a week and then retired himself. 49k down the drain. Moving swiftly on from him, Branko Milanovic joined us from Radnicki for £3.9 million. A very, very capable central midfielder, particularly in terms of his work rate and his uh, vision and teamwork. His determination of 20, his decisions of 17 with 16 stamina. Absolutely fantastic player. He is going to be a backup player for us, but at 19 years old, two and a half star current, five star potential. He's going to be fast, fantastic going into the future. Next to join us was Guido Bomber. We joined from Lanos for £5.5 million. He's going to be one of our starting centre-halves. 20 jumping races, fantastic. He's going to be one of our main targets when we're taking corners at six foot six as well. I'm hoping with 17 bravery, even with his poor, relatively poor heading at 11, he'll be able to get himself some goals this season from set pieces. But 23 years old, centre-half was a real struggle for me in terms of the summer transfer window. I couldn't find that just that one 
You know, I always find one, but I couldn't quite get that this season. So he's coming in and will be first choice. Next up was Annabella Zarate from San Lorenzo for 5.75 million quid. And probably one of the best signs of the summer. A fantastic, fantastic complete forward striker. Now it's his physicals are where he's weakest, which is not usually how I go for players. Usually physicals come first and then the technicals and mentals catch up after that. But he, I anticipate this boy being absolutely superb at 19 years old with potential to grow, at least according to my coach and staff. He looks absolutely superb at six foot tall as well. I'm hoping this boy will be able to lead us to some sort of glory. Next to join us was Mario Buckle, 10.75 million quid, one of the best signings of the summer. And it was in a position where we didn't think we were going to actually improve. Chris Dubelbiss, of course, was our starting defensive midfielder last season. But Mario Buckle was available for 10 million quid. And at 21 years old, that current ability that he's already got with the potential to grow, it was just an absolute no-brainer. He is an upgrade on Chris Dubelbiss. And he will only get better over the course of the season. I'm absolutely thrilled with this signing. Radek Rada is the next one through the door from Slavia Prague for 11 million quid. A left wing back, a much needed option at left wing back. Obviously, Korobov had a great season last season, but he is very attacking and very weak in the defensive areas, whereas Radek Rada is much more well rounded and hopefully he will give us some stiff competition on that left hand side. He will be the starter, no doubt about it. Depends who ends up playing better in specific games. Maybe Rada might be more suitable for tough games, whereas Korobov might be more suitable for teams at the bottom of the table. We'll have to wait and see how that goes, but a very, very good signing in my opinion. So Luis de Cordova from QPR was next for 15 and a half million quid. And this is the one I'm most disappointed in. I mean, it's not bad, but I'm not so happy about it now. English, 19 years old, striker, done fantastic in the championship last season. I think he caused us some problems in the game against QPR. Fantastically well-rounded, as I've said. We are playing two complete forwards, so we need someone of this quality. He is better than Stamankovic. As you can see here from the polygon, we're comparing the two. Uh, Dirk Cordova is in the green while Stamankovic is in the blue. And I think you would agree that uh, Luis Dirk Cordova is definitely a more well-rounded striker than Stamankovic. Even though my coaches don't think so, I'm hoping this boy will be absolutely superb. Maybe we did end up paying a little bit too much for him. But English obviously always comes with the premium in these sorts of leagues. We've just got to take it while we can and I'm happy enough with the £15.5 million fee, if not delighted. Next to join us was Rui Rea from Brazil. Is that Corinthians? I'm assuming it's Corinthians. £16 million central midfielder. Just particularly well-rounded. 23 years old, there's not much room to grow here. I was looking for the finished article in central midfielder. He obviously comes in and directly replaces Duval and I think we definitely have ourselves a little bit of an upgrade. Whether he plays in the box-to-box -box midfielder role or the ball-winning midfielder role remains to be seen. I'm not exactly sure what I am going to be deploying this season. We'll tinker with it a little bit, see which one works best in specific scenarios, but he can do either pretty perfectly. So, happy to get him in. Next to join us, once again from Brazil, was Victor Hugo Cruz for £20 million, a much-needed upgrade in the attack and midfield area. Obviously, when I signed him, I'd already had Zapelli, and I was thinking between the two of them would really have a strong attack in midfield too. Obviously, Zapelli ended up retiring, so we're going to be relying a lot more on Victor. Very well-rounded physically, mentally well-rounded as well. Technically, he could do with some improvements, particularly with that technique at 12, but passing at 18 is great. Long shots, 13. First touch, 13. Dribble on 14. Vision of 9 is pretty disappointing, which is why he won't be playing in the playmaker role he will probably be playing as an attacking midfielder someone a little bit more direct can get the most out of his physicals and i think he's a great sign in that 20 million quid now we're getting on to the big phase david nuno from crystal palace for 30 million quid he is one of those that we've signed previously as i've spoken about earlier i was really struggling for that top end center half i couldn't quite find them we ended up going for someone at 27 years old 30 million pound from a premier league rival he is stupidly well-rounded and I'm really surprised that Crystal Palace let him go or that he was willing to join us from Crystal Palace. His mental uh, attributes are where he shines the most, at least compared to the other centre-backs that we have at the club. Physically, he's good as well. Technically, he's fantastic. And hopefully, he will be that rock at centre-back because we obviously play a hugely attacking formation. We need two decent centre-backs. I'm hoping between him and Bomber, we might be able to not concede too many. And finally, was Vitaly Sokolov from Zenit for 33 and a half million pounds now by far the best player we've signed 
by a country mile. 20 year old Russian, seven caps for the national side already, central midfielder, and he is just superb. He, he's going to be one of them that we look back on in 10 years' time and think we really did sign a world class midfielder. Already valued at 41.5 million quid. He's on a huge wage for our squad at £83,000 per week. But four star current, five star potential. This this well rounded is just bonkers for a twenty year old, and I'm absolutely delighted to bring him in. Even it's probably not the best deal we signed, but definitely the best player. Not a screen. I usually show during my transfer window episodes, but I just wanted to take a look to see how the fans and the board have reacted to the signings that we have made. Now the fans overall give us a C, whereas the board give us a C plus. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. The board were very happy with the Steve Hudson signing because he was a free transfer, and very happy with Radic Rada signing. I think it was basically due to the uh, low wages that he ended up signing. 11 million quid isn't a huge amount of money for a Premier League club. The fans in particular are happy with the Annabelle Zorati signing, which is good. They are not very happy with the Deval sale or the Luke Sanders sale. Obviously, being first team players from last season, you can sort of understand that. And yeah, it is an interesting screen if you ever want to look. It's in club vision, performance, transfer activity. Um, you'll see it there. In terms of the season then, what are the board expecting from us in the Europa League 2? They expect us to reach the quarter final, which I'm hoping we can go all the way in that competition. I want some European glory in the Yo-Yo Man save. They also want us to fight bravely against relegation, which is far enough, reach the fifth round of the FA Cup and reach the fourth round of the League Cup. Let's go see where the media think we are actually going to finish during the course of this season. They are actually predicting us to not get relegated, which is a little bit of a surprise. Usually, as a newly promoted side, you're always in the bottom three. Um, and I guess you could say we are in the bottom three as we are level with all of those clubs in the bottom five in terms of 1,000 to 1 odds of winning the league. But interestingly, all of our former clubs are in a row. Huddersfield, Burnley, but, uh, not Burnley, Birmingham, Barnsley, Crystal Palace, Leeds, Forest and West Brom. All clubs we've managed, all clubs we've bought the Premier League. And for this final season of Yo Yo Man, they're all in the Premier League together. Now, I know Barnsley and Leeds have been relegated in between, but it's just, it's just nice to see all the clubs that we've actually been able to manage find themselves in the Premier League for our final season. So, we're being through right into the ring in our first game of the season against Arsenal in the Premier League. They are the current holders of the Premier League title. We are away from home as well. It's going to be an absolutely huge upward battle. But if we can get anything from this game or even give them a good game, I'll be relatively content with that. So, in my opinion, this is our best first eleven. should everybody be fit. Stefan Polk, the goalkeeper we signed in January in the Championship, we didn't end up replacing. Nuno and Bomba a new signings. Delonzo was also a January transfer window signing, playing at right wing back. Buckle, Rada, Rui Rui, Sokolov, Cruz, Zerati and Decordova will all be a part of our first eleven once they are all fit. Obviously, they aren't all fit right now, so Stel Wagen comes in at right wing back for the injured Delonzo. And Gavin Barton ends up coming in for the injured Deco Dova. Stamenkovic is injured. Frankie Grand is also injured. So striking options are pretty limited. We're going to have to go with him. So let's get to today's game. Arsenal away from home. The Premier League holders. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm expecting a pretty heavy defeat here. I'm not sure we quite have the level of quality to be able to match this sort of side. They've got Fabio Luis, our former man, playing in central midfield. who's absolutely phenomenal. Let's get the kick off and let's see if we can hold our own. So we have kicked off and we have our first highlight of the game six minutes in. We've went on the counter straight away against Arsenal and we've given away a penalty straight away. Rui Rea. I mean, what are you meant to do? You're coming up against one of the best sides in the league and unfortunately the players make stupid mistakes like that and cost you a goal. Teddy Chatelain getting the opening goal of the game and we have now a mountain to climb. Another highlight now, 25 minutes in, honestly, going by the match stats, Arsenal are all over us and Buckle dilly-dallies on the ball and Arsenal are in once again and two individual mistakes from two of our new signings. It's cost us two goals. Um, not the greatest start I had in mind. Obviously, it's against Arsenal. You can't complain too much. Got to be realistic in your expectations, but disappointing. Yeah, I'm just going to attack and I'm going back to what we would usually play rather than trying to hit them on the counter. Obviously, they're a better side than us, so the likelihood is they're going to pick us apart even more. But just playing our natural game, how we tend to play it, 
will hopefully see us perform a little bit better. Not when Stefan Polk's doing that, though. <laughs> Teddy Sheldon gets his second goal of the game and puts Arsenal 3-0 up. Turkey switches the ball at the right-hand side. He gets completely does the defender. Stefan Polk. I mean, can he be a fault too much for that? I think he can, to be quite honest with you. He should be holding that or at least parrying it in the direction the ball's going rather than back towards the actual advancing player. And at half-time, complete domination by Arsenal and we're 3-0 down. And it doesn't look like much is going to be changing in this second half. 52 minutes in, we have our first highlight of the second half. And it's Arsenal who are in possession. They've knocked it about well in the midfield and Shatterley in the right back almost goes for his hat-trick. Corner for Arsenal, Cherky plays it in, Bomber gets it clear. Of course, the six foot six centre half should be uh, theoretically great at defending and attacking set pieces, which is one of the main reasons why we bought him. Here we have another set piece, Cherky with the uh, free kick to the back post, goes over the bar. Come on, just give us one highlight that's actually an attacking threat by us. Buckle plays it over the left hand side for Rada. That was a great pass, Sokolov into Cruz. Buckle to Ruiria. Come on. Let's start getting back into this game. Still Vargan on the right-hand side. He's got a decent cross on him. He, I mean, I mean, come on, this is why I want Alonso fit. Still Vargan gets a bat, though. He's batting the box. Buckles on the edge. He shoots. Oh, I thought it was going top corner. Another free kick for Arsenal. Goes just over the bat. We look to make a few changes here. It's obviously, we're just looking to get some boys uh, fresh for the next game. We're, obviously, we're not getting back into this. Sebastian Kalera can come on for Sokolov. In the centre of the park, Redick Rada can come off for Oleg Korobov at left wing back. We'll make our final sub uh, 87 minutes in. We'll get Lewis Dekodova on. He's obviously slightly injured right now, so I'm hoping it's not too much of an issue. He is returning to full train within a couple of days. And there we have it. Our first game in the Premier League in charge of Stoke City is a 3-0 comfortable win for Arsenal. So looking to that board's response about the Arsenal game, they are pretty negatively predisposed to that. Obviously, we're getting a D rating from them for the Arsenal match. And I agree, we didn't really play that well and we didn't play it to our full potential. In terms of the next episode then, boys, European football is upon us now. I don't really want to bring you this game because we're going to win. Cork City, all the Icelandic guys, so Irish Premier League or Icelandic Premier League, we should be able to get past this and the next game, I believe, is the group stage. So I think that's what I'll bring you. The first game of the Europa League 2's group stage. And I shall see you there. Just want to say, apologise if I sound a bit weird during this uh, episode. I've cut my tongue and it's doing my nutting. So I sound a little bit strange. I apologise. Hopefully it will go away by the next recording. But anyway, boys, if you have enjoyed today's video, please consider leaving a like. And if you are enjoying my content, get yourself subscribed. But until next time. Take it easy.